loud. Got it. All right. So we're talking about ethics. What do we? This was two weeks ago before I lost my voice and was taken over. What do we say ethics was? I'm gonna need some real participation from oh. three people, or else I'm gonna fall asleep. <laughs> um, what do we say ethics was? Oh, yeah, study of morality or study of right and wrong. And we talked about some of the ways and theories that we would have to explain what is right and wrong. But what we're going to do this class is actually look at three different theories of what makes something right and wrong. And so just to start, I want to do this little chart, which kind of shows how this happens. So at the very top, we have a question. Um, is more can you see that up there oh yeah that's i'm good. sorry about the reflected yeah. lights is morality real and there's two different questions you could or two different answers you could give to this what are they yes and no yeah no yes so no equals what's called anti-realism Anti-realism is the view that morality is an illusion. There's no such thing as right and wrong. It's just that we think there is, or the government tells us there is, or somebody tells us there is to hold us in line. Anti-realism. So it's like not real. This right here is not something we're going to be talking about. It is a very alive view, but mostly amongst philosophers. In our everyday lives, I think most people think that if I walk up to a puppy and kick it directly in the face, I'm doing something that's objectively wrong. Mm -hmm. Like there's no question about it, kicking puppies bad. An anti-realist would say, no, that's just an illusion, but not many people are gonna hold that point. Yes, if this one's called anti-realism, anyone have a guess what the other one's called? Realism. Realism is the view that morality is real. There is such a thing as morality. And as a matter of fact, most people are realists about morality. Now, within realism, there's a divide. You ask yourself the question, can people with different views both be <clears throat> right? That's the key question you ask here. And again, two possible answers. What are they? Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, no. So the no view that if two people have different views on what's right and wrong, that as a matter of fact, one of them has to be incorrect is a view that's called objectivism. There's no one here. Yep, hi. Give me a second to add your uh, attendance and bonus points. When nobody shows up, people get bonus points. Um, this feels fair. You've put in extra work. You should get extra credit. Um, this is not what I need. I need to chat up. No, that's objectivism, you said? Objectivism. Objectivism is the view that it's the same for everybody. On the other side is a separate view, which generally is called relativism. Now, to make this point, um, let's talk about what Relativism and objectivism mean. How many people have heard of these terms, objective or relative? Any yeah. people online? All right. What does it mean for something to be objective? Anyone know? So that's object to. Objective in this sense is a slightly different word. And I don't know why they're related. Mario? Like fair, fair. That's part of it. It's and when you're fair, um, how is everything treated? The same equally. <laughs> That's the key idea with objectivity is that it's the same for everybody. So a good example of this is what is bigger, the marker or the bottle? Bottle. Online people, what's bigger, the marker or the bottle? Bottle. 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 Yeah, it's the same for everybody. However, we're now going to do. Uh, excuse me if you get uh, motion sick. <laughs> All right. We miss you guys. <laughs> People in person, what's on the right? People online, can you see what I'm holding? Yep. Yes. What's on the right? The marker. Marker. The marker's on the right. People in person, what's on the right? Bottle. The bottle's on the right. Who's correct? 
Both, both correct. of you are correct. We all Why correct. are you both correct? Well, you're both correct because what right and left are relative notions. You're only on the right or left relative to your position to the things. So there's no right, like more correct way of being right or left. It's just, if you're in person right now, one of them's on the right. If you're online, a different one's on the right. So that's what it means to be relative. That what is true or false is relative or depends on some other thing. Objectivism, by contrast, is no matter where you are in the room, where you are in space, it's the same for everybody. And so what are some other, just to make this point, what are some other things that are objective? Just things that are the same for everybody. Um, Numbers, yeah. That one plus one is two is the same for everybody. It's not like if you're from Mars, even if you were from Mars, they'd be the same. Um, the laws of physics, no matter where you are, if everyone were to drop something right now, it would fall to the ground. That's the same for everyone. Um, what are some things that are relative or true only relatively other than right and left? Up and down. So up and down, if you're flipped upside down, what's up and what da is down is opposite. That's another thing that is relative to your positioning. What else? All right, if I were to, uh, if I were to go to the bar around the corner and order myself a beer, is that legal? Yeah. If I were to take a three-year-old with me and they were to try to order a beer, is that legal? No. 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 So legality and drinking is relative to what? To the person. Age. It's relative to your age, the age of the person. Another one, um, I am 21 years old and I'm in New York City and I have my ID with me. Am I allowed to go and order a drink? If I go to Saudi Arabia and I have my ID with me, am I allowed to order a drink? No, it's a dry country. So the laws are relative to the place as well. So that's what relativity means. So in this case, what it is to say morality is objective versus relative is the idea that Objectivists say what's right for you is right for everybody ever. And we just have to figure out what the right things are and what the wrong things are. Relativism says that's not the case. In different places and different times and for different people, what is right and wrong actually changes. So that's the key idea with objectivism versus relativism. One answer, same for everybody, different answers depending on something else. Make sense, everyone? We good? All right. Uh, I don't feel like <laughs> Seemed easy enough. Uh, so this is going to continue our chart from there. So just you can plug this. You, because you aren't writing on a board, can uh, just attach this to what you had before. But I'm working with a board, so I have to do it this way. These are the three views we're going to be talking about today. Talking about. These three views are what are called cultural relativism, deontology, and consequentialism. Consequentialism and deontology are both objective forms of morality. They both think there's one right answer and it's the same for everyone ever. Cultural relativism says it's different depending on, well, based on the name, what is what's right and wrong depend on? Your culture, yeah. So cultural relativism says what's right in one culture is not right in another culture. The ontology says it's the same for everybody. Consequentialism says it's same for the same for everyone. But these two give a different account 
of where this thing morality comes from. So why it is that the right thing is the right thing. They have a disagreement about how you define what the right thing is. And so we're gonna go in like, as if we're reading Hebrew style where we start on the right and go to the left. Um, so again, these two views are approaches by philosophers to try to capture our common sense intuitions of what's right and wrong. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. So can't remember, did I draw trains in this class or did I draw trains in my other class? No, you did not draw trains. Okay. So consequentialism. Based on the name, how do you think a consequentialist defines what's right and wrong in terms of like, what is the ultimate thing we're looking at when deciding whether something's right or wrong? Consequences. The consequences. That's the key idea behind consequentialism is what's right and wrong is entirely a matter of the consequences of your actions. And now the question that's gonna arise is what consequences matter? And so here's the idea that motivated consequentialism. Um, how many of you have heard of the trolley problem? I'm trying to decide whether I want to do the boring version of the trolley problem or like a modified version. Online I've people? I've okay. heard of it. All right. Um, let's just... All right, thanks, Avion. Uh, all right, so let's just go with the original one because it's easier to draw trains than nuclear missiles, um, which is my other version of this. Yeah, let's make sure that this... Yeah. Actually, you're confused. Uh, One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One. All right. Uh, can computer people see my beautiful drawing? All right. So what is going on in this drawing? Well, we have a train here. This train is chugging along the tracks. You happen to be standing here. You see this train chugging along and you notice that if you do nothing, this train is gonna run over five people. However, if you press this button right here, the train is going to change directions and go this way and run over one person. In this context, what does your gut tell you is the right thing to do? So should you press the button, morally speaking, yeah. is the right thing to do, press the button. If you agree that the right thing to do is press the button, raise your hands or your little digital hands. Wow, we have a very unconsequentialist class. I've never had the numbers at 50-50 before. Online people, what do we have? Should you press the button to save five instead of one? Again, these are complete strangers. You don't know them. Yes. All right. No. What, for those of you who have this intuition, what is it that makes you think you should press it? Yeah, five is greater than one. And now why does that matter? What is it that happens if you kill five people versus, or have five people die instead of one person die? <laughs> no, yeah, you, I don't think you're going to jail for this regardless <laughs> but what is it and this is a really dumb like i'm not asking uh trying to be a tricky smart question why is five people dying worse than one person dying so that's one thing the media will look worse but that's not the only reason like we don't just do things so we don't show up on the nightly news looking like assholes <laughs> like and, and i'm asking the most why is death bad like, that's the question I'm asking here. It's the dumbest possible question. Why do we not like it? It hurts. It hurts to die. And who else does it hurt? All their families, five people and all their families. So why is it? Well, it looks like this right here is going to cause more pain than this is. And so what we should do is the thing that will cause less pain. Here's another case. Imagine 
that if you do, you're super rich and you are donating toys to children for Christmas. What's better to donate one toy to one child or a, a toy to a million children? Not like they have to share the one toy, like each kid gets a toy. Like yeah, why? What's better? better it makes you feel better, but let's say like, you're yeah, you're impacting more people. And what are kids gonna feel when they get a toy? Right. Happy. So on the flip side, in that case, there's more pleasure or happiness. So this is the intuition that motivates a version of consequentialism that has anyone, uh, it starts with a U. Anyone know what word it is? Any takers? Utilitarianism. Yeah, utilitarianism. Thank you, Yoko. Oh, this one doesn't move. Am I still on the board? Oh, but I'm right in the middle of the light, so you can't actually see what I wrote. Uh, I'm going to write it here. Utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a popular moral view that says the right thing to do in any situation is the thing that causes the most pleasure and the least possible pain. And that's not for you, that's for society or humanity as a whole. So because pleasure is inherently good and pain is inherently bad, and in fact, they're the things that all the other good and bad things in the world derive from. So something like money, is money a good thing to have? Yes, I know. yes to some degree. And in the sense that it is good, why is it good? It buy, you can buy things. And what can you do with, why do you want to buy those things? Yeah. They happy. make you happy. Yeah. They keep you alive. They prevent you from having pain. And in cases in which we say money's not a good thing, in what sense is money not a good thing? Like, say that again? Well, you don't have a lot of it. But on the flip side, what did Biggie say? No yeah, mo money, mo problems. And so in that case, why does he have no problems? Well, because the amount of money he has is causing problems with his uh, social group and the sorts of things he has to worry about. So in that case, it is causing him pain. That is the part of mo money, mo problems. So the idea here is anything else, puppies. Why are puppies great if you like puppies? Well, they make you happy. Why are babies great if you like them? Because they make you happy. Why are they bad? Because you have to clean up their shit all the time and they keep you up all night. That is the idea of what is good and what is bad. That's the idea here with utilitarianism. Everything is a matter of the consequences. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Consequentialism is the view that, yeah. Um, so utilitarianism is a view of consequential, a version of consequentialism. So the idea here is this is the general type of thing. So any view that says the right thing or wrong thing is a matter of the consequences is consequentialism. But the most popular version of that says the consequences that matter are the amount of pleasure and pain that are caused for humanity as a whole. And this is the intuition behind it. The idea is in a lot of cases, we do choose things on the basis of what's right or what's um, causing more pleasure and less pain. And you can also see that there seems to be something behind this if we change the case slightly. Imagine we find out that these five people are all murderer rapists, and this one person is about to cure cancer. What's the right thing to do in that case? Yeah, you kill them. And why? What is the reasoning behind that? And specifically, in what way? If these people stay alive, what is going to happen in the world? They're going to there might be more murder and rape. And if this person stays alive, What's going to happen? Yeah, cancer. cancer cure, more people. So even in the case in which you're choosing to kill the five over the one, it's still a matter of the pleasure and the pain that you're bringing about. So that's the intuition here with utilitarianism. Everyone on board with what the view is saying? Are we good? Good, good, good. Yes, All right. yes. Now, if you remember, there are three views here. So if consequentialism and specifically utilitarianism was something everyone agreed upon, we wouldn't have these two views as well. So there's something about utilitarianism that people have disagreed with. So what is it, just thinking about back to utilitarianism, what are some problems that might arise if you try to accept this view? Yeah. So like in that example, it's like playing God, you're like choosing who's that scene with 
picks. Let me let me erase this and write on this board. Uh, Why is it bad to play God? What is it about playing God that is bad? Just like who are you to choose if someone's worthwhile? Yeah. In some sense, you are choosing who is worthwhile. And in some sense, that makes us feel very uncomfortable in a lot of cases. Um, Marielle, you had a hand. All right, so playing God is one. And tied in with playing God is another aspect, which is utilitarianism in the similar sort of way of your playing God, some of the consequences of, or some of the implications of the view have some things that many people wouldn't be happy with. So let me give you a case. All right, um, in honor of our dear friend in the hallway who thinks I'm crazy, let's just go with it. Uh, what have I just drawn? No, not a dead person. No. Person yeah, but what type of person? Look at fat little limbs. Baby? Yeah, it's baby. a baby. This is a baby. And now imagine we lived in a society in which we have a million people. And these million people, because of something that's happened, are all sadists. What is a sadist? They like to see other people in pain. So a masochist is someone who likes being in pain. A sadist is someone who likes causing other people to be in pain. Um, now imagine this society of a million sadists. Nothing makes them happier than stabbing babies with needles. Like just you just stab the needles into the baby. And the baby screams and cries and is very miserable. But all these million people get happy. So like million happy people. This baby is not happy. It is a baby though. So it just screams and cries a lot. Now, according to a utilitarian, is this an okay practice in your society? Yeah. Yes. yes. As long as the pleasure brought to these million sadists outweighs the pain caused by the baby, the right, or caused to the baby, the right thing to do is to stab this baby with all the needles. And that right there, how many of you want to say that stabbing a baby with needles is ever the right thing to do? Yeah, I don't think many people want to say stabbing babies with needles is good. Gladys, you came in at a hilarious time. Um, you just walk in and I'm talking about stabbing babies with needles. Um, <laughs> all right. So weird consequence or weird implications specifically can lead to tyranny, how do you spell tyranny? Tyranny of majority. Has anyone heard this phrase, tyranny of the majority before? All right, so what is the majority? Just over half or the larger number. And what is tyranny? What is a tyrant? Anyone know? It's the same thing that like Tyrannosaurus Rex comes from. What do we know about T-Rex? Because they're big and they're mean and they control the dinosaur world. So tyrant here is someone who's big and mean. So like a dictator who controls everybody and doesn't give them any freedoms is a tyrant. So tyranny of the majority is the idea that in a if utilitarianism is correct, then there can be cases in which the majority can play God and use people in whatever way, so long as the amount of pleasure being caused is higher than the amount of pain being caused, which a lot of people are unhappy with as a conclude uh, solution to utilitarianism or a consequence. Yeah. Um, you know what could be an example of like play like that up at all? Yeah. So like it brings a lot of people pleasure, like playing on that up, but then like the players are like that ball. Yeah, that's another good case. According to utilitarianism, because the NFL makes so much money and makes so many people happy. The right thing to do is to sacrifice these lower class people who are willing to play the sport, even though it's quite possibly going to lead to traumatic brain damage that is going to lead them to die young, become suicidal, and like become aggressive. 
And so we are sacrificing this small number of people for the greater good. And that really upsets a lot of people. And we don't necessarily want to say like that is a, if our consequence of our moral theory is like, if we love gladiator fights, bring them back is the right thing to do. Did you have a hand, Michael, or was that a, okay. So everyone on board with this issue with it. Here's another one. How do you measure pleasure? So what's better, uh, a good nap or a good meal? Mm. Yeah, it depends. And how would you even go about measuring that? Like you get, imagine we put in a policy of at Brook, either everyone gets a free decent meal or everyone gets an hour of credit for taking a nap. How on earth would we decide which is the right policy to do? According to a utilitarian, you have to measure how many people will get more pleasure out of it and not actually what they would vote on because people might be confused. It's actually, we'd have to know what brings more pleasure to everyone. And that's really hard to quantify. Would you rather have a stomach bug or have to get stitches? Imagine it's like a big scar across your face. What if it's a, uh, would you rather break your, let's see. Uh, would you rather lose a hand or lose a foot? Hand. Okay. Uh, would you rather be blind or deaf? Yeah. Okay, so all of these I think are questions where these were actually pretty consistent, but it would be tough to judge which one would you rather do given pleasure and pain. So it's just, it's not gonna give you easy answers in a lot of cases. What's going to be better for the United States to reduce taxes on the general population or forgive all college debt? How the hell can you make that decision and calculate what's going to bring more pleasure and pain? So utilitarianism has a lot going for it, but it's very hard to judge what it is with utilitarianism, what's going to be right and wrong in an everyday case. And it's got these weird consequences as well. Everyone on board with utilitarianism? Good, 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 good. Computer people. All right. And computer people, you are allowed to type to me like this. Hi. Hello. Ciao. Um, which brings us to the second view. And here's kind of a thing that motivates the second view. It's similar to this uh, intuition behind the playing God or weird consequences. So here's going to be another case. It's a version of the trolley problem that's just a little bit different. You are still here. There is still, or there's, there are still five people on a train track who are about to be run over by a train. My trains get uglier as class goes on. All right. Choo choo. Again, you can save these five people by doing something. However, the thing you can do is as follows You have had a bad super glue accident and you've nailed your feet to the floor of this bridge. Don't ask how it happened. You can't move. But you have noticed that there's another person standing here. And for some reason, you know that trains have automatic brakes, that if they hit something that weighs over 100 pounds, they will automatically. Great. And they will stop before they hit these five people. But the only thing around that weighs over 100 pounds that can move right now is what? No, nope, you can't move. You're stuck to the ground. The person, the yeah, stranger. this stranger. So you could push this stranger in front of the train. They will get killed. They will get smashed by a train to oblivion. But these five people are going to be saved. According to utilitarian. What's the right thing to do? Push the guy. Push the guy. That is 100% what a utilitarian is going to say. However, how many of you feel comfortable that the right thing to do here is push the person? Do we have any one with really strong utilitarian intuitions? It's like, yeah, push the person five greater than one. I'm done here. Yeah, like a hero. I, I don't know if the news is going to think you're a hero when. I don't know, the guy's a hero. Well, the guy, he didn't have a choice. You just pushed him. I mean, Oh, no, there's there's cameras right here. Oh, not in the camera. Yeah, there's a camera right here that's seeing you. 
So how many people feel the right thing to do is to push the guy? Is there anyone who strongly feels this? How many people actually think it would be wrong to push this guy? Morally wrong to push him in front of the train? All right. So in this case, our intuitions seem to flip. And the fact that in this case, five doesn't outweigh one seems to be another sort of uh, consideration that we take into account when we're making these decisions. We could also do another version of this, which is like the first one, but the one person on the train is your own mother. Um, how many of you would press the button to switch it from killing five to killing one if the one is your own mom? Is there anyone who would press the button? Wow, a good person or a, a hardcore person. Most people I have asked have the intuition that you shouldn't press the button if it means killing your own mom. And you know it's your mom. It's not like, a, she's not like hidden under a bag. Um, so Zena says she wouldn't. All right, so in this case, I, and I share this, actually, I think in that case, I tr think my intuition is the right thing to do is to push the button, but I wouldn't be able to do it. I think I would like knowingly just be like, I like my mom too much. I can't do this, but it makes me a terrible person for choosing my own well-being over the well-being of these five people's families. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I have weird intuitions, but um, what is it? Why isn't it true? Because this, I think, is going to help justify why I'm not a bad person. Oh, oh we know. And oh, this will God. help bring this out as well. Oh, yell know. first and then Mike. I feel like it's human nature to like, Look out for oneself. So if like you know, you're your mom, like I feel like you're gonna do what's best for you. And you know, appointment for other people than I do. My God. It was like let's say if you were on that platform, if you were on the tracks and somebody else was in that situation, they'd say fuck you, say my mom. So they, nobody else would feel bad. So really? and it does seem like uh hey Rachel, welcome to the party. Um let me just mark down, Zena's here, Rachel's here. So let me just mark down attendance before I forget. Uh, uh, Zena, Zena, Zena. Professor, what is it with your mom blast. again? Can you repeat that? Yeah, give me one, one second, Yelka. Um, uh, Gladys. All right, so the idea is there's a different version of this. Imagine there's a case where instead of pushing a stranger, it's the original like split track case. But when you press the button, the one person who gets run over is your own mom. In that case, many people want to say you shouldn't press the button because there's something about your own mother, be it human nature or be it that there's just some things you shouldn't do because of the nature of your relationship to them. And so what is it? Let's actually analyze here. What is it about pushing this person in front of the train that feels so bad to us? The pushing part, and not just the pushing part, because imagine a slightly different version. Imagine you, you tap this person on the shoulder and you say, dear sir or madam, or however you choose to identify, uh, if I were to push you in front of this train, it will save five people. However, if I, it's totally your decision. If you want me to push you because you want to save these five people, I will do it. But if you say no, I will not push you. And the person says, yes, that is all right with me. You can push me. And then you push them. Is that somehow better than the first version? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why? What has changed? Consent. consent has changed. And why do we care about consent? What is it about consent that is such a key concept? Uh, it's an assurance of our uh, actions. Yeah, so part of it is an assurance. And also, when you're getting consent, what is your relationship to the other person like? So it's well, and how are you treating them? Fairly, Fairly and like another person who's worthy of your time. In the first case, do you give a damn about this person in any way and their views or their cares? No, you're just pushing them. In the second case where you get consent, you are taking them into account. You are thinking of them as a person with dreams and hopes and views that you should take into account. So the idea here is what separates uh, the pushing someone with no consent versus the pushing someone with consent is basically in the one case, you're using them merely as a tool. You don't care that they're a person. 
relative to what you're doing, they are a meat sack. They are a 150 pound meat sack that will stop a train. In the second case, you are treating them as a person who can stop a train and taking their wishes into account. So this is the intuition that drives the second moral theory we're gonna talk about right now, which is, oh, oh, I could have just drawn that. I didn't realize I was still hiding under there. Deontology, deontology. The person who this is, you don't need to know this for this class, but if you're interested, the person whose name this is most closely associated with is Immanuel Kant. He's a dead German man. Um, <laughs> he was a weird dead German man. I think he died in like, I think he was alive in the 17, late 1700s. Um, but yeah, anyway, deontology has this idea that to do the right thing, you must never treat someone merely as a means, but always at least partly as an end in themselves. All right, so what the hell does this mean? Uh, the key words here are means, end, and uh, merely and partly. Uh, so what is means and ends? How many people have heard these two terms used together, means and ends? Yeah, uh, anyone else on the, the chat? Like the means and the ends of your, okay. What are the means and the ends? So you may have heard it in the context of the ends justify the means. What on earth do these words means and ends mean? The result or the goal? And what is the means? How you, get there. how you get there. So the idea here is you can also think of it as the tools you use are the means and the end is the goal you ultimately want when you use those tools. So when you build a piece of furniture, what is your end? You go to Ikea, you spend the day fighting with your friends and family, and then you get your big box home. You take out the screwdriver, you take out the hammer, you spend three hours cursing and swearing and building this piece of furniture. What is the end you have in mind? What is it that you're working towards? Build. To build, the, the thing you're going towards is a new piece of furniture in your house. What are your means for getting there? You gotta put it together. The instructions, the tools you use, the time you put in, that's the means to an end. So the idea here is that to do the right thing, you must never treat anybody or somebody merely as the means, but always treat them at least partly as an end in themselves. And this is just what's going on in this case. In the first case, when you don't ask anyone, you just push them. They are a mere tool. They are a means to stopping the train. And that is wrong. On the flip side, when you ask for consent, you are now treating them at least partly as an end in themselves, somebody whose views and desires and life is worth taking into consideration. Everyone on board with that? All right. <laughs> and the key here is the partly matters. So is it okay to use other people to some degree? Yes, we are all using each other right now. How are you using me? Information. Gaining information and just as importantly, if not more importantly, for you all, grade, credit. You are getting credit. What am I getting? I get money and I have a captive audience who has no choice but to listen to my bad jokes. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's open mic night in which I'm getting paid to do it. Um, so that right there is so I am using you partly as a means. But I, we're also treating each other as ends in ourselves. You are not all cursing at me, throwing things. I'm not just arbitrarily picking your grade out of a hat and never showing up and just not giving a damn. So we're treating each other with respect, but we can also use each other. So the key here is you cannot use each other merely as a means. 
So in a case in which if I were just to show up and never prepare and not give a damn about any of your grades and just arbitrarily give you all things by just like, well, their name starts with an F, so they get an F. Like that would be treating you merely as a means. But if I treat you partly as an end and I actually put time and thought into comments and feedback and designing things, that is acceptable by deontology. Everyone on board with the, the view here. Now, going back to our little chart. Again, we have three views. We talked about utilitarianism. It isn't perfect, which drove us towards deontology. But deontology isn't our last view. There's another view on the board, and there's actually about 17,000 more that I haven't written. So what is it that would lead someone to go, okay, but deontology isn't totally right either? So what are some of the flaws you can see with this idea of deontology? Can anyone think of any issues with thinking the right thing to do is always never using people as tools? It's kind of hard to put it in practice. Like if you're in the... No, it's so, so the, there was some confusion about uh, whether we were in person or online or various other things. So I am simultaneously teaching some Zoom people and you, and there's gonna be a recording and it's chaos for everybody. Um, but you did just get yourself some extra credit. So yay, Lee Chan's here. Yay, all right. So Yael said it's hard to put into practice. So what do you mean by that? Because I think that is one of the issues. Like if you're in the army, like you got an officer, I don't know the name. Yeah, but like they're governing like a whole people. Like you can't, and you need like there's a crisis. You can't be like, wait, I need to know your name. Yeah, it seems like in practice there are times that you do have to use people simply as tools. According to deontology, there are no exceptions. It is never okay to uh, choose between, or it's never okay to use someone for the greater good. But it does seem like in certain cases, you might want to do that. If you're in the army, it seems like a general should use their troops as tools to hold the line. So that's one issue. So issue one is... Seems hard to put into practice because gives or allows no exceptions. Here's another issue, which is what Yelka just said in the chat. It doesn't actually tell you what the right thing to do is. It only tells you when you're doing something wrong and to avoid doing those wrong things. So if you've got two choices, neither of which are using someone as a tool, you don't actually get an answer from deontology. In that case, it's like, well, you can do whatever you want. Should you either, you made no promises, should you go to have dinner with your grandma or should you go and see your friend's choral recital? Well, deontology says in neither case are you treating someone merely as a means. So what's the right thing to do? Well, deontology doesn't give you an answer. What's a utilitarian gonna say? What's the right thing to do if you're deciding between the recital and uh, grandma? grandma? Why? Family. Family? But how's a utilitarian going to answer it? I think you're right. There would probably be grandma. But what would the actual explanation be? What is utilitarianism? It brings more pleasure to the world. So grandma, who lives alone and never sees humans and is sad all the time, is going to be so happy. While your friend, who's going to be up there on a stage and not even see you because the lights are bright, won't be brought as much pleasure. So a utilitarian can give an answer here. But in this case, a deontologist is just going to say, either one's okay. And that doesn't help you. So doesn't always give answer. Also, another issue with deontology is that Sometimes, or no way to pick between 
So this is kind of the flip side of that one. This is no way to pick between two bad options. So imagine a case in which, uh, let me see how to do this. Um, so yeah, imagine it's the case where you're a general in the army and you can either choose to use this uh, unit to plug the hole in the line or this unit to plug the hole in the line, or your option is to do nothing and just let your troops stand there. And in that case, you are just gonna use them to slowly, by default, they are just gonna be your tools to slowly lose the battle. So anything you do, you're using somebody merely as a tool. A deontologist is just gonna say, well, there's nothing to be done here. Like you're wrong and there's no way out of it. A utilitarian is gonna be able to give you an answer. You have to assess what is gonna cause the most overall harm. But in this case with a deontologist, there's no way actually to answer that question. Everyone on board with those issues with deontology? All right, let me take a sip of water and blow my nose. And then we, uh, I'm gonna mute you all so you don't have to hear me blow my nose. Uh, you all. Any questions thus far? Anything? We're going along. Well, actually, this is going much faster than it sometimes does. All right, I need to lift you people up for a second, move you over here, because I need to get into my bag, which is the stand upon which you are all sitting. All right, back in position. Oh, now you're wobbly. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, any questions thus far, deontology, utilitarianism, anything. All right, come back to me, people in person. I don't see you. I'm now seeing a lot of foreheads and a lot less eyes. And since there's only six of you, it makes me feel sad. Um, so yeah, utilitarianism demands that what, well, actually, it's like you're saving <laughs> someone's lives on your computer or like you forgot someone's birthday and are doing really important shopping, then uh, utilitarianism says I should suck it up and just be sad. But if on the flip side, you're just cruising the internet because you uh, feel like it and it's making me very, very sad, then it's a bad thing to do. All right. So you'll notice we now have a third view. So if people aren't consequentialists and they aren't deontologists, they're sometimes cultural relativists. Now, what is cultural relativism? There's two different things we can talk about here. One, what the view is. And two, why on earth anybody holds it? So first things first, let's talk about what it is. Actually, before we talk about what you, what, uh, cultural relativism is, let's talk about what cultural relativism is not. So here's a fact that everyone accepts. People in different cultures have different beliefs about what's right and wrong. This is not disputable. Everyone accepts this fact. Different cultures have different beliefs about what's right and wrong. So what's an example? What's something that's thought right in one culture and wrong in another culture? Abortion. Abortion, that is one. There are places where it's deemed completely morally unacceptable, other places where it's deemed okay. What are some other examples? We can also go across time and space. Slavery. Yeah, so the morality of uh, head coverings and full burqas in different countries. Within some places, it's deemed oppressive to women. In other places, it's deemed uh, expected and part of the culture. Having multiple wives, Xavier says, that's another really good one. There are cultures in which it's deemed morally wrong 
to not have multiple wives and other cultures in which it's deemed morally wrong to have multiple wives. All of that is uh, agreed upon. The key difference between this and cultural relativism is cultural relativism takes it a step further. Cultural relativism says what's right, oh, that's not how you spell the right that I want to say, what's right and wrong is actually different in different cultures. So the first one that people have different beliefs is compatible with one group being wrong and the other group being right. So you could, an objectivist would say, all right, some people believe abortion is wrong. Other people believe that abortion is okay in certain circumstances. And one of the groups is incorrect and the other group is correct. A cultural relativist, by contrast, is gonna say, one group believes that abortion is okay. Another group believes it's not okay. And they're both correct. And they're both correct because they're in different cultures. In the same way with the right and left, the people on the computer were correct that the bottle was on the right or was it the marker? I don't remember. And people in person were the opposite way and both groups were correct. So cultural relativism says that morality is like that, that what's right and wrong is like right and left. But instead of position, it's based on what culture you're in. So to illustrate this a bit more clearly, Let's give an example. We've got two different cultures. All right, two different cultures. New York City in 2023. I've kidnapped my neighbor, tied them to the basement floor, and I'm stabbing them through the heart. Aztec culture, say year 1000. This priest has tied this person to the floor and it's driving a knife through their heart. Now, there are two different things. Everyone is in agreement. The Aztecs believe that what they're doing is okay, and everyone in this city thinks that what I'm doing is fucked up. Testing out uh, people who are here. We all agree me kidnapping my neighbor and stabbing them would be wrong. Okay, good. Um, I'm glad that we're on board with this. All right. So everyone is on board with that. And every theorist in morality agrees that these different groups have different opinions on it. However, an objectivist is going to say, only one of these groups is correct. Either the people in New York today are getting it right. It is never okay to drive a knife into someone's heart as whatever. And the Aztecs are wrong or flipped it around. The Aztecs were always right. Human sacrifice is good. And we're just a bunch of prudes in 2023. That is what an objectivist would say. A relativist is going to say something different. They're going to say rather... Because in New York in 2023, this is unacceptable, this truly is unacceptable. While over here, same action, because it was acceptable in that culture, it really was the morally right thing to do. The, a way to think about it is there's no right answer 
that is up in the sky that we're all trying to understand. There's nothing like a divine order from a higher power that tells us what's right and wrong. Rather, the only way you can see what's right and wrong is down here on the ground in the particular culture. So in this culture, not acceptable, so it is wrong. This culture is acceptable, so it's right. And you can't from the outside. I, in New York, cannot make statements about the Aztecs, and the Aztecs, if they had a time machine, couldn't make statements about me. Everyone on board with the view? Computer people, human people, we all good? <clears throat> all right. That's what cultural relativism says. There's two more questions that I want to address today. One is, why on earth would someone be a cultural relativist? And two, why on earth do people think cultural relativism isn't right? Which brings us back to our little loop of what should we think? Well, the point of this is to go through possible theories, not get a right answer. Um, so let's start off. What is the motivation for cultural relativism? There's two different motivations that I see, um, but every semester somebody comes up with even more. So what is the motivation behind cultural relativism? Why think that cultures have it differently? Mary Alden Michael. Like respect for like different people's like Yeah, respect for others. So cultural relativism came up historically in response to what major I don't even know, uh, sociological type of event that was carried out by white Europeans from about the year 1492 to 1950. Not slavery so much. Uh, that's part of it. That's one of them. But um, colonization. So when the Brits showed up or when people, yeah, so when the Brits showed up in North America and came across all these Native American people, what did they think about these people? Dangerous. Dangerous. And more importantly, what did they call them? Savages. Savages. They were seen as less civilized and less human in some sense. And they thought of themselves as bringing enlightenment and knowledge and true civilization. And they thought of themselves as better. Now, post-colonial, after that, people started to realize, you know, it's really fucked up of white people to go around the world and tell everyone else that they're uncivilized uh, because every culture seems to have very similar beliefs. You know, white people, that's fucked up. And a lot of people were like, yeah, that was fucked up. And so part of the motivation behind cultural relativism is to recognize colonialism and the way that people approach it was fucked up. There's something deeply wrong about like, oh, me, white person showing up in like, getting in a time machine and going, hey, Aztecs, you're doing it wrong. Because they have a full culture with a full history and an understanding of how the world works. And what right do I have to show up and say, you're doing it wrong? It just seems like all we can say is things are being done differently. So that's one of the major motivations is to have this respect for other people. What's the second motivation? Um, does anyone have any other ideas for the motivation behind this? All right. Um, how did you learn what's right and wrong? Your parents taught you. And how did they learn? From their parents. And how did those, your grandparents learn? Generation. Yeah, generation after generation after generation. Now, if you had miraculously, had, imagine that um, you were born on a teleporter. For some reason, you, your mother birthed you onto a teleportation platform. And on another teleportation platform, somewhere else, another baby was born. And this baby, in a completely different culture, is born and swaps places with you. So you are born and nobody notices. The parents think you get uh, transported to say, what are those little islands in the Indian Ocean? Uh, no, no, no. There's these tiny little islands where it's still like a hunter-gatherer and there was a missionary the other year who tried to go over there to bring them Jesus and the locals yeah. killed him. Yeah, uh, because he was just like, he like swam over and was like, I'm here to bring you Jesus. And they were like, we don't want Jesus and killed him and threw him in the ocean. Um, so those islands there, if you were for some reason teleported with that baby and you were raised by that family, what would your moral views today be like? 
whose moral views would you have? Your biological parents or the ones who raised you? Yeah, the adopted ones who raised you. So it doesn't seem, it seems like what drives our understanding of what's right and wrong is how we were raised. And how we are raised is very much tied in with our culture. So it seems that if you'd been born elsewhere, you'd be equally convinced of other beliefs. So the idea behind this intuition is you know what's right and wrong because you were taught it. But if you've been taught differently, you'd have been equally convinced that other things were right and wrong. So why should you think that the things you believe today are the correct views? So if that's the case, then it sure seems like the only thing that de decides what's right and wrong at the end of the day is what your culture has taught you is right and wrong. That makes sense to everybody? We don't know? Okay. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, let's power through and finish this off. And I know we're flagging, um, but let's just power through, get this done, and then I can say have a fucking great spring break. Um, yeah, I think you have to make it to Tuesday. Um, I think yeah. Tuesday's the last day of classes. Oh, so you're done after Monday? Nice. Um, now, despite those good things for cultural relativism, there have been issues with it that people have brought up. What are some of the problems with cultural relativism that you can think of? This idea that what every culture says is correct in that culture. There's some things that we seem to wrong. Yeah. Some things seem too wrong, even if a culture says it's okay. So I think we can get our heads behind like multiple wives being all right if a culture says it's all right. We can get our minds around uh, even human sacrifice being all right. But what are some examples of things that we can't seem to wrap our heads around being co morally correct? Like even if it's another society, even if they do things differently. Child brides. Say that one again. I said child brides or. Yeah. Uh, so there brides. seem like, imagine you have a child, you marry somebody off and force them to have sex with their new husband at age seven. That is a practice that I think a lot of people want to say, like, even if another culture says it's okay, it is not okay to have sex with seven-year-olds as part of a marriage. That is one example. What else? What other historical events or practices where even from the outside, we want to say, yo, that's kind of fucked up. It's not a heavy one, but like, I don't know if it's right. By what? Like the, the Holocaust. That is exactly the one that I think is a very clear case of this. The German people in the year 1942 thought it was evidently okay to do the Holocaust. We don't really want to say from where we are now, that doing the Holocaust, Holocausting, which uh, is a lot, murdering millions and millions of Jewish people and other sorts of individuals of minority groups is okay. But a cultural relativist is going to have to say, well, if the people in Germany at that time thought it was okay, the Holocaust was okay. And that's not a view that many people want to accept. Generally speaking, if the conclusion is the Holocaust was okay, not a view of morality people want to say is a good view. Um, what are some other issues? Can anyone think of other issues? All right, here's, here's another one, if no one else is thinking of one. No progress. So in the year 1800, what practice was common in the United States, or at least half of it? Slavery, race-based slavery. What do we no longer have in the United States? Slavery. Have we gotten better as a society? How many people share this intuition that it seems like getting rid of slavery is an improvement? 
I feel like most people are either uh, busy, asleep, not here, or agree. Uh, so yeah, it seems intuitively like we've had progress. But according to a cultural relativist, that's impossible. You can't say we've progressed as a society. Why not? Well, how do you measure progress on anything? So when you were born, you weighed, I don't know, does anyone know what their birth weight was? We can make it on a 12 and a half. Wow, that is a big boy. Wow, I feel bad for your mom. Um, 12 <laughs> pounds of baby. All right. Now I'm going to imagine you weigh more than 12 pounds now. Let's just, I think that's a safe bet, Michael. So. Yeah. So we now uh, weigh more than that. How did you measure that you have progressed in your weight? This was measured in what? Pounds. And this is measured in what? Pounds. Pounds. It's a single scale the whole way through. Imagine though this. I say, when I was born, I was, uh, I'm going to tell you about all the progress I've made as a baby. When I was born, I was eight pounds. And now I'm an American. Sure. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense because there's no, like, what is the scale I'm using? There's no single scale here. Or I was once eight pounds and I've grown so much. And now I uh, am five foot eight on my right leg and five foot nine on my left. Like, look at that growth from 12 pounds to this height. What? That doesn't make sense. I got a really nice new bonus. I went from making um, $30,000 a year to being happy. What? How is that progress? You need a single scale to measure things on. And according to a cultural relativist, what scale do we measure 1800s America by? What do we judge their morality of 1800s Southerners? What's, where does their version of what makes something right and wrong come from? Their beliefs. Or cult Say that again, Yalka. I, I said their beliefs. Their... their beliefs and their culture. And for those white Southerners, slavery was okay. We today do not believe that. According to us, is slavery okay? No. And in our culture, does that make it wrong? according to a cultural relativist. If our culture says it's wrong, is it wrong for us? Yeah, not a yeah. trick question. So 2023, it is NYC wrong. But there's no way of saying that we can go from here to here as progress because it's using different measurement systems. This is pounds, this is feet. There's no such thing as progress for a cultural relativist. That makes sense to everybody? All right. Yeah, is that a question or a thought or a, all right. So that's another issue with it. There's two last ideas that I want to talk about. These two are consequences issues that Cultural relativism has consequences that some people don't want to accept. The last two undercut motivation. So the idea is the motivation behind cultural relativism isn't as strong as cultural relativists think it is. And what these two views or these two responses try to say is that the things that motivate cultural relativists are often better explained in other ways. And that it's not actually that people have different views about what's right and wrong, but it's something else. So uh, different beliefs, not different values. So to bring this up, I'm gonna give a kind of silly example. Imagine we have two different societies. And we're going to try to judge from the outside which society values human life more. And we're going to try to say which one considers human life more sacred and therefore has different moral views about what's right and wrong in their society. Here's society A. If you commit murder, you get... your head chopped off, or no, you commit thievery, 
you get your head chopped off. You rob anything, your head gets chopped off. Society B, if you rob, you get put on a boat and you are told, go out to sea, go straight until we can't see you anymore and never come back. From first perspective, which society seems like it values human life more? B seems like it values human life more. And so this is something that a cultural relativist will look at and like say, look at these different practices. This culture thinks that killing someone for thievery is okay. This culture does not. Therefore, these two cultures value human life differently and they have different moral views. We need cultural relativism. But what if I told you the actual key difference here is people in society A think the world is round and people in society B think the world is a flat disc that once you get like 20 miles out at sea, it just falls off. Now, in that case, why do these people get sent out to sea? Well, they're getting sent out to sea, hoping they fall off the earth and die forever. So in this case, what we originally thought was this culture values life more is really just they have different views about how the world is. These people think it's round. So if you want to kill your thieves, you got to chop their heads off. These people think the earth is flat. So if you want to kill your thieves, just put them in a boat and send them off the edge of the earth. Once you know that fact, which society values human life more? Neither. They're on the same page. So the idea here is different beliefs, not different values, is actually look at the societies around the world. And once you understand how they understand the world to be, what might motivate cultural relativism is no longer actually a practice that should motivate cultural relativism. So even something like this, human sacrifice, why was it that the Aztecs engaged in human sacrifice? Anyone know? It's the same sort of reason that people do a lot of religious rituals. Yeah, to make the gods happy. They believe that if they didn't do this, the gods would punish them. Today in the United States, people do many, many things to avoid God punishing them. What do they do? They go to church. They, Catholics will confess. All of these things are the same sort of thing that the Aztecs did. It's just they had different beliefs about what made the gods or God happy. So you look at this from the outside and say, oh, the Aztecs don't value human life. But in truth, if you actually look at it, they just had a different view about how you save lives and how you keep people well off. So in this view, you could say like, hey, it's not different values that these different cultures have. It's just they have different beliefs about what is uh, the world is actually like. So it's not different values. It's not different beliefs about what's right and wrong. It's rather how best to bring about the same things, namely societal success, uh, namely well-being for the most people. Does that make sense to everyone? This is the idea that like, hey, look more closely and you don't have the motivations behind cultural relativism. Here's the last one. Different circumstances. So I'm actually going to use uh, Xavion's example of having multiple wives to some degree in this one. So uh, Let's talk about the Inuit, people who used to be called Eskimos, but I now do not use Eskimo because I think to some people it is offensive in an offensive term, so therefore I don't use it. I'm using Inuit, talking about the same group of people. Now, within Inuit culture, in certain Inuit uh, groups, polygamy or the having of multiple wives is perfectly acceptable. What is else is acceptable? infanticide, especially of girls. What is infanticide? Killing babies. Infanticide is the killing of babies. So in this culture, killing of female babies is deemed in some situations that we would not accept an acceptable thing to do. Lastly, picking, there's no good term for this, grandma out to die. 
within these cultures, it is a common practice to say to your old people, we love you a lot. Here's a little bit of food. Go away. We never want to see you again with the full expectation that they're going to die out in the wilderness. Now, you look at all of these practices from the surface level. Does it look like the Inuit have different values than we do? They are willing to tell grandma to go die. They are willing to kill babies and they're willing to have multiple wives. So it seemed from the surface like they do things differently than we do. Yeah, it seems like that. But what is the key fact about Inuit culture? Well, where do the Inuit live? Think of it as where do Eskimos live? The Arctic. The cold, that's the key. And it's not cold, it's fucking cold. Like we are talking about places where in winter get to like minus 80 degrees, like really fucking freezing. You cannot farm there. You cannot grow anything. You cannot have cattle. You cannot have livestock. How do you survive in a place that gets to negative 80? Well, what's your main source of food? Fish and other sorts of hunting. It includes things like walrus hunting or whale hunting in a tiny little canoe over cold freezing water so anyone know if you like if the water is uh so if you like go to alaska so you know those like the crab fishermen that why is it the king crab legs cost so much money well it's because it's really dangerous to go and fish for these things why is it so dangerous because if you fall overboard it takes less than 30 seconds before you are unconscious because the water is so cold so if you fall out of one of these little boats hunting a walrus, and like it's a small kayak, if you fall out, you're more or less dead. Also, has anyone ever hunted a walrus with a spear? Anybody? No. Uh, walruses are really big and they have big pointy tusks that could fuck up your day. And when I say really fucking big, I mean these things weigh like close to a ton. It is not easy work. If you are out with a little spear, trying to stab a walrus, and you are doing it over freezing cold water, what is likely to happen to you? Yeah, get fucked. And what does that mean, practically speaking? You're dead. Yeah. You are likely to die out there in the wilderness. Food is hard to come by, and you can't afford extra mouths to feed. If you do, everybody's going to die. So if you can only bring in enough food for 20 people to survive in your group, and somebody has a 21st child, what is the thing that you have to do for the group to survive? Get rid of one person. So in this extreme circumstance, you can begin to understand why on earth you would start to have these extreme practices of killing babies. Why would you kill a baby? Well, if that baby is putting if that baby's existence is putting everyone in the group at risk of dying, you can begin to understand why you'd kill a baby. And specifically, why would they be killing baby girls more likely than baby boys? Yeah, hunters are normally men and hunters are far more likely to die. So in a society, for a society to function well, you need to keep the birth rate above the death rate. And if you don't kill off, um, basically, if you allow the number of girls around to get too, too high, you'll end up with basically, because all the men are off dying hunting, the, the numbers will get so messed up that you aren't going to be able to reproduce except with major inbreeding because you'll be down to one man who can no longer hunt. He's just going to be making babies all the time. So the requirements of keeping the sexes about equal in number requires killing off girls more than boys. Why do you get rid of grandma and kick her out into the freezing cold? Because they're older and they're likely to die sooner. Yeah, they're likely to die sooner. And also, what can grandma provide to your group? Nothing. Nothing. Grandma is not pulling her weight. Grandma is just a mouth to feed and her very existence is threatening the entire group. So in that extreme case, even killing grandma can be begin to seem like a reasonable thing to do because it's not the choice. Today in New York City, if you kill your baby, what is the other alternative? Like if you didn't kill your baby, what would that baby's life be like? 
Is it going to die? No. Is everyone you know going to die? No. The baby, you might be a little more strapped for cash. The baby might not get the attention it would ideally get because you're juggling too many babies and a job and other things. But it's not like everyone you know is going to die. However, in extreme conditions, you're not making the choice between baby lives and baby dies and everything else stays the same. Your choice is between baby dies and everybody dies. And in that extreme circumstance, you can begin to see why baby dies might be the correct sort of circumstances uh, or the correct sort of decision based on those circumstances. Same thing with kicking grandma out. Your choice is not send her to nursing home or kill her. Your choices are kill her or everybody dies. And again, in that extreme situation, it looks like even our values might lead us to say, send grandma out to die. We loved you, grandma. You did great, but it's time to go. You've got too much arthritis and you eat too much. So in that sort of case, you can begin to see this. Yeah. How is that an issue? So this is an issue because it's undercutting the motivation. Why is it that cultural relativists say we need cultural relativism? Well, they look around and say, look at the Inuit people. They have completely different views than us. They practice polygamy, infanticide, and kicking grandma out in the cold. Therefore, we need cultural relativism to explain why they have so many different practices than us and think those practices are right. The response now from the objectivist is, hey, hey, hey now. Or a utilitarian would come along and say, hey, hey, hey now. The Inuit people are actually having the same values as we do. We have a utilitarian value, do the greatest good for the greatest number. It's just in these extreme cases, doing the greatest good for the greatest number is infanticide and kicking out grandma. And in their position, you do the same thing. So we don't say they have different views about what's right. They have the same views we do. They have, their, their culture is not all that different in terms of what it thinks is right and wrong. All that's different is it's fucking freezing there. Does that make sense? It's like meant to say, hey, cultural relativists, you have all these ideas that are meant to motivate you. People learn different things from their parents, but really, no, we all learn the same thing. Save the most people you can. And I think to illustrate another one of this, how many of you, let's just end with, uh, this can be our last example here before I summarize. Um, Cannibalism. What is cannibalism? Eating other humans. How many of you think cannibalism is right, morally acceptable behavior? Anybody who thinks it's a morally acceptable behavior? All right. Yeah, it depends on the case. I bet I'd be willing to, I bet all of us, well, here's the thing. I hope all of us would be willing to be cannibals in the right circumstances. So imagine the following. We go on a school field trip. And we go to a, on a school field trip to, uh, say, California. And on our way to California, what's between us and California? Well, there's these big mountains. And imagine our pilot is drunk. And our pilot crashes into the side of this mountain. And I'm the one sitting at the front of the plane, and I'm dead. I am now dead here. And you are all here, and because... Uh, Baruch is cheap and I'm cheap. We got the flight that didn't have any snacks on board. No snacks, no food service. There's nothing to eat on this plane. And then when the plane crashes, there's nothing to eat. The only thing edible around is what? My dead body. And you all know you're up in these mountains and nobody's going to be able to find you because you're crashed in the middle of the Rockies. But you do know that there's a little town down here that if people were to be able to hike down there, they could contact civilization and get help. But to hike down a mountain, you need what? Energy. And what do you need to do to get energy? Eat. So your options in this case are either send some hikers down the mountain with strips of my flesh to survive upon, or nobody's going to make it. In that case, how many of you think eating me is the right thing to do? Yeah. Now, why did I bring up this case? This is a true story. Um, it's not the Rockies. It was in the 1980s, there was a Chilean rugby team 
they crashed in the Andes and this actually ended up happening. And they actually did have a handful of people who ate the dead who died in the crash, had enough energy to hike down to civilization and save the rest of the team. Um, so this is a true story case. In that sort of extreme case, it seems like all of us might be willing to be cannibals. Even if we think from the surface level, cannibalism is wrong. Because in extreme cases, our values of preserve human life, save those you love, those around you, require you to eat human. And if in some cases, even you might be required to eat human, then the motivation behind thinking that cultures that eat humans have completely different values from you might suggest, well, maybe they don't so much. Because in my, in the right cases, I might be a cannibal too. So everyone on board with how that sort of argument goes. All right. My throat is running out of gas, which is good because I more or less done what I would to say. Uh, I erased all my little charts. So let me just summarize where we are. Uh, we're going to go left to right this time. These are three different views about what makes something right and wrong. Consequentialism, it's the consequences. Utilitarianism defines it in terms of pleasure and pain. Deontology says it's a matter about not treating people as tools. Cultural relativism says it's a matter of what your culture says. Each of these views has a lot of intuitions behind it, but they also all seem to have problems. And what basically ethics as a field is doing is people try to take these different views and defend them from their various problems. So you have people who are utilitarians and say things like, well, you might feel that it's wrong to push a person, but that's just this disgust reaction you have programmed into you. But in truth, the right thing to do on the bridge is to push a person. A deontologist who will say, all right, you might think that the right thing to do is to sacrifice one group of soldiers over another. But in truth, that isn't the case. You are truly doing something wrong. A cultural relativism, relativist will look at things like you can't make uh, or you can't judge from the outside. Things like the Holocaust truly were right. And they will try to explain why those consequences aren't really the case. They'll say something like, no, the Holocaust was wrong because people in Germany were uh, contradicting themselves. They were they were supposedly good Christians who felt that everyone was created equal before God, but at the same time were killing an entire group of people. So each of these groups has responses. And what ethics is, is attempts by each group to respond to these sorts of consequences of their views and explain why actually this view is right or this view is wrong. Now, practically for us, we're not going to do that anymore this semester. This was our day on what the theories are. We're going to do more what's called like applied ethics. We'll be looking at particular questions next class and the class after about um, real world problems and how we should feel about them. And the reason I'm bringing up these different views is when you're assessing these sorts of practical issues, things like hate speech, things like uh, privacy uh, in the United States and in the internet age, these can be useful tools as you begin to try to understand how you feel about the more practical issues. So that's why one, it's useful to know about these things because you will hear about them and come across them in everyday life. Like people still talk about long dead German Kant in certain uh, contexts. Utilitarianism gets mentioned, like I've read like news articles that bring it up. Um, and cultural relativism, there are big debates about this stuff. So all of these are worth knowing on their own, but also we're gonna be using them as tools in our next couple of classes. All right, so last thing I wanna say is business. I don't see you next week, you have spring break. Yay, everyone gets a break. The following Friday is the day that uh, spring break runs up to Thursday and then there's randomly a Friday class and then it's the weekend. I am assuming that many of you will still be gone. I'm going to run that class exactly how I'm running this class. Actually, let me see this.
hate speech, privacy. I could run those. I, I Right now, what's going on in my mind is I'm thinking whether to cancel next class because it's a stupid day to have school. Um, let me shut off the recording because this is going to make boring viewing for other people later.